I came across Dan on Anthony Pompliano Pomp's podcast. And as soon as I heard him speak, I wanted to speak to him and interview him for Design Company podcast. So here's a little quick uh, introduction of who Dan is. So he's an American entrepreneur and professional poker player who has a net worth of $50 million. Dan is the youngest founder of a publicly traded company in history. So he's the youngest IPO creator. He launched a company, Who's Your Daddy? Energy Drinks at the age of 23 after he sold $15 million dollars of clothing and getting a 9.5 million licensing deal with starter apparel in 2010 he launched victory poker which became the third largest team of professional poker players as a poker player he has won the 5k ceo poker championship the canadian poker tour main event the 10k chip leader challenge and the 25k high roller event at Commerce Casino. He also reached the final table of the European World Series of Poker main event in 2011, where he finished seventh and won $183,029. Dan's company, Who's Your Daddy, has over 300 products and focuses on their king of energy, energy drink. He has served as an angel investor or consultant for 14 companies. Dan launched modelcitizenfund.org. The charity creates backpacks filled with supplies for the homeless and is the official charity of the World Series of Poker Europe. He started celebvidi.com in 2014, which lets fans purchase video greetings or ask questions to celebrities, fitness experts, business leaders, and athletes. In a nutshell, Dan is the youngest IPO creator in the history worth 50 million and as you'll see in this podcast is an absolutely top guy so it was a pleasure to interview him I didn't want to waste any uh, time uh, talking to him about who he is and what he's done so this little intro is just there as an intro so that we can go straight into the uh, depth of the conversation enjoy Dan, thank you very much for joining us. This is going to be so exciting. I, I can't wait to ask you the first question. And we'll start with the purpose. Uh, so the first question I, I, I pre-wrote was, what is the most important things in, in companies to you and why? <laughs> yeah, e execution is my number one thing. It's just because a lot of people talk, 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 and then they postpone things. And it's always a meeting about a meeting about a meeting. And I just want to get things done and I want my staff to get things done. Investors, partners, vendors, clients, anybody I work with, it's just execution. Everything else is noise. Okay. Okay. So doing matters more than uh, talking and, and ideating. Uh, yeah. What about in terms of the purpose? How important is purpose in companies that you've run and companies that you're looking at? Yeah, purpose is the driving force. So what I mean by that is, there's lots of cars with gasoline in them, but it's not a lot of car there's not a lot of cars knowing where they're going and why. And so when you're on a road trip and you're going to Las Vegas, you get there and you're excited and it's a mission, right? If you're just going on a road trip indefinitely, well, there's no clarity, right? And not everybody's excited. People sleep in the car. They don't tell stories in the car because they're not that excited. There's not a real true destination. When you have a destination or you have a purpose to it, it makes the whole ride more exciting and it makes everybody involved way more involved. Sure. So like, how do you, when you're working with purpose, do you set out the purpose yourself or are you looking at companies that already have a purpose? How do you approach that? Sure. So I won't invest into a company that doesn't already have a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't tell, I can't give them their purpose, mm -hmm. meaning I need those founders and that staff to be excited, you know, or if I take on a social media client, I need that brand to already know what they want. If I, if I have to guide them on that, they're not going to be excited about it. And if I have to change their or pivot them, they're not going to be excited either. It has to come from them. And so any business that I start, it only, I only start if it has a purpose. Otherwise, there's no point. Makes sense. Dan, if I could uh, bounce back on that. Love what you said about execution. That is the key. So many people talk about mission, all these things. So one thing I'd like to ask is, how, why have you seen work best? 
in terms of tying purpose down to execution, right? Not getting lost in like mission statement, oh, we're going to do this, but really executing, making happen while still being aware of the higher mission and the higher purpose. So the, the purpose has to just be that driving force, meaning everything you do all day long is not based on that. It's based for that. Meaning if you have to deal with staff meetings and emails in the, in the daytime, it's not based on your purpose. It's just a checklist of things you have to do throughout the day. But when you're doing your report or pitching clients or dealing with vendors or dealing with convention, like whatever it is that you're doing, those are the driving force for the purpose. The little minutia in between is not like the, that exciting or, and people try to like tie those things in together. It's not really truly relatable. The, those things are a, a checklist. Those things are a part of your daily life and to get to your end goal or to your overall overarching mission. And so the best way to tie it in is, have goals based on your purpose. Meaning, if your goal is to feed a million people, it's still a huge deal when you feed 10,000, right? And so there has to be milestones along the way that you get excited about, your team gets excited about on your journey. Because if you hit 1 million, you're not done, right? You're gonna wanna fit a 2 million or 3 million. So yeah. the, when I say that goal or that mission at the end, that pot of gold, that's not the end. Because they're, the, that wouldn't be that exciting. If I just said, hey, let's start a juice company together. And when we get to 10 million, it's over. When we get to 10 million, like we want to go more. I want to do 20. <laughs> like I want to keep going. And so if you're going to feed X amount of people or save, save the world, or you're going to sell 10 million water, watermelon bottles, whatever, it, that is the moving goalpost. So you know where you're going, but then that can get bigger. The number always gets bigger. Otherwise, if you're just doing it for the money part, then forget the purpose. It's just focus on the money. Mm. We'll, we'll get we'll get to money a uh, bit in a, in a bit. Uh, so just a, also a side side question then uh, is purpose the t today in companies more important or less important than before in your sort of gut feel? So from a consumer standpoint, people buy into a purpose. People buy into a story, and so that's why you see all these charity elements and aspects tied into brands even if it's not normally part of their purpose there's so many brands that are now tying in a small percentage to charity just because that's now part of their checklist meaning like you kind of have to do it and so it, it's interesting to watch how people are adjusting and making uh, tying these things in because they feel like it's mandatory the greater good is there. I prefer them to do it. I prefer them to tie those that purpose or tie in that charity. But ultimately, it's still not true from the heart or true from the mind of what that company was doing or what that person was doing. Awesome. You just segued your into the next question, which is um, why do you think you've become the youngest person to do an IPO in the world? Like, why you? <laughs> yeah. So. I was obsessed with working like in high school. I was working three jobs, saving up money, selling candy at school, selling baseball cards, like whatever I had to do all day and night, I was selling and working and, you know, and so when it came time to start my company, you know, we did a, a million bucks right out the gate and then we did 9.5 million year two and we were 18, 19 years old. And so I had a trajectory of like, if I just keep working like this, X, Y, and Z will happen. And then when I was 22, these investment bankers came to me. They're like, look, you guys have done eight figures in revenue now. You're in all these major department stores. What do you, what's your goal here? I was like, well, I don't want to sell it. I'm not, I like this stuff. Like I was, I was a baby. I was 21, 22 years old. <laughs> so they, they said, well, we can take it public and then you can have a lot of access to capital to, to scale it even bigger because you can't raise this kind of capital as a private company. We weren't even raising money. I just kept, I was building it. It wasn't even like, you know, I wasn't raising money ever. And so at that point, um, we decided, okay, fine, we'll go public. If we can launch this energy drink, that'd be great. We need a lot of capital to do a beverage because you always have to have four to eight weeks in lead time of the beverage mm. in your warehouse. It means you always have to have millions and millions of dollars in inventory on hand mm. for floating and flipping. And so we did it. You know, We spent the next year and spent a ton of money on legal fees and accounting fees and auditors and that whole headache. And when public, I was 23 years old. This was April 2005, and it was a 
still nobody's got nobody's done it since i don't know why i mean people could do it younger than me i was 23 at the time um but it just hasn't it just hasn't happened as of yet so how how did you actually come across the ipo as a route because you know uh, to me I, I studied business management at master's degree and i knew of ipos but i always had this kind of mindset and that's going to be my next question it was mindset around ipos were for other people for like those big sort of ceos you know big corporations but not necessarily for me and that was my mindset back then. I've, I've changed my mindset since then. But how did you have the mindset to just kind of go like for the IPO so worthy in your life? So the advantage of being young is that you're not scared, right? Like <laughs> when, I, when, when, I was, when I was younger, I would just jump off of a cliff into a lake because I was 23. Who cares? Now I wouldn't do it the same way, right? Or if I would do it at all because it's different now we've had that life experience. So I think it was just not that not knowing, you know, it was, if I go back and think about it, I prefer not to go public again, mostly just because of the headache. You, you spend six figures per quarter on auditors, accounting, legal, eight Ks, 10 Qs, every three letter, you know, 10 K this and eight, like it's just like so many different accounting and auditing things that takes a lot of time. It's, you know, hundreds of hours per quarter of stuff. Um, that's mostly just reporting on stuff you already did. So it takes away from your business. However, the capital side of it's great because you have access to a ton of capital and your investors have a, a liquidity event and have a liquid asset. So yeah, I mean, looking back, it was sheer just not knowing what I was in for. I knew that it would give me access to capital and I would focus on the business. And it was always a frustration of mine because I was selling, we were in 55,000 retail stores. Like I was nonstop every week with 43 distributors, chain stores, building a business. And I kept having to fly back to the office to sit with the accounting and sit with the auditors and sit with the lawyers over and over and over because there was no Zoom calls back then, didn't exist. So I, it was frustrating in that regard that I could have built the business even faster and bigger if I didn't have to keep flying back in for lawyers every week. So, so would you recommend it, lawyers and accounting uh -huh. are just part of it. Lawyers and accounting are part of it. It's not a bad thing. It's mandatory. You just have to keep auditing over and over and over. So uh, do you do you recommend an IPO as a, as a route forward for companies or would you like going back now would you do it or not do it? <laughs> I would it's a rare scenario that I would say it's worth it unless you need a very large access to capital. There's a ton of private capital out there now. Back then, there wasn't. Now, I, it would take me three days just to list off the amount of private funds that are out there and private VCs, private angel investors. There is a mountain of them. It's, un, it's, un, it's unreal how many there are of angel investors like me. I've invested in 36 companies. I'm tiny compared to all these other guys. If you go on AngelList, angellist.co, there's infinite angel investors and in, in funds. Like you just, there's just so much money out there that the only reason to go public is if you need an exorbitant amount of capital or you want to buy other companies in your space using stock. Makes mm. sense. So one thing I'd like to bounce off on the theme of people that, and I mean, obviously you're somebody quite driven, uh, you know, even from a young age, you're doing all this setting, you're getting a company up and running, but you know, on your own, you can only go so far. So one thing that I'd like to better understand is who has been the kind of most influential and you know, powerful in terms of helping you get where you are today? Um, I mean, initially it was my mom. You know, it was just, it wasn't any entrepreneur stuff. Like she wasn't, it was just like, I had to work to make, to take care of my mom in that sense. Not like she needed me. I wanted to do it. Does that make sense? Like it was like that driving force. And then from a mentor's perspective, that didn't happen for like, I had this guy, he had sold his clothing brand for 135 million. And him, me and his son were working together on my clothing brand. And so the dad was like the one that was kind of overseeing us and protecting us over the years. I still work with that son now, 20 years later. Like I was talking to him two hours ago. Like he, he's still part of my life. So from the clothing aspect, he was a big mentor of mine. And then my best friend was the founder of Marvel Studios. And so he created like the Avengers and Iron Man and all those great movies. And so for the last 10 plus years, he's been the guy I talked to about major life stuff or major business stuff. 
And how, how did you come across them? I mean, in, like I'm based in UK and Mohammed is sitting in France. You know, it, it's not like a typical in Europe to kind of just bump into those people. How did you come across them? Yeah, I, at events. So I, I go to a lot of different business events and I'm not like a social butterfly. I'm, I'm at a lot of things all the time, but I'm pretty quiet unless spoken to. But I would align myself with the people that are throwing the events or the sponsoring the events, or I would sponsor the events. I would in integrate myself into these live events and you just meet so many people because then the person throwing the events, they know everybody there because they came through them. Right. And so if I go to a business real estate event and I'm with the owner, I'm going to meet all the speakers and it's just natural. Right. And so as I do those things, it just kept happening over and over and over. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, so what about in terms of when you're managing people inside the company and getting that sort of um, thinking right across the company on who thinks what we should do, where the sort of bottlenecks are, what can be improved, uh, all that kind of stuff. How, how did you go about doing that uh, in, in companies or how do you go about doing that in companies these days? Yeah. So I mostly leave it to the founders to as far as vision and then i want to hear from it's kind of like the captain needs to sail the ship i do want to hear what everybody else on the ship that's rowing i want to hear what they think but ultimately because they can see it differently uh, when they're you know when they're rowing they can see it differently because they're in they're in it day in day out but ultimately i leave it up to the founders or myself if i'm running the company or if i invest in a company the founders are who i'm looking at for the vision and direction and the people that are involved in it, I want to hear from them, but I'm, it's, it's pretty rare that I'm saying, hey, you know what, let's pivot because of this. Um, I'm usually, it's going to be a corrections that come like, hey, you're doing this wrong. And I can see that because I work in marketing or I work in, I'm dealing with the customer service and I'm hearing the people are complaining about the price point or the time it takes to ship or, you know, whatever the type of product or brand is, people can tell us what to fix. Um, but I don't not necessarily like change the course, you know, change the direction. So what's your current um, sort of typical day like? Are you mostly investing into other companies or are you still running your own companies? How, how does that kind of split up? Yeah. So my main, my main day job is my elevator studios, the social media agency. So we spend around $60 million with influencers for brands, products, and mobile apps. So that's my main, that's my day job. The angel investing, I'm only investing in about six companies per year. I'd like to do more, but I'm super picky and I'm only doing it on companies that I can help scale. I throw the live events every month. Right now during quarantine, I throw them every Sunday, but during normal life, I throw them every month. I throw these large scale live events for free called Elevator Nights. And then my, a lot of my day this year has been focused on building that 100millionacademy.com. That's been a big, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of content on there. It's taken a big team to build out like the Netflix for entrepreneurs. And so that's been a huge focus of mine is that hundred million Academy. That's like overwhelming amount of time right now. Um, and probably not going to go away just because it takes so much to produce as much content as we're doing. So in terms of the approach to, to systems and things like that, are you mostly building systems internally or are you piggyback, piggybacking into other uh, third party systems or is this sort of mishmash of, of different systems that you use to operate companies? Yeah, most, it depends on which, which company, and which brand. Uh, most of the things that we do is actually via group chats. And so the reason my stuff happens so fast and effective is I have everybody on a WhatsApp chat or in a texting chat for every client for every brand, for every vendor, and for every investment, for every uh, staff meet, like each one has its own group chat. And it's just like, because with email, with Trello and all these other things, like people can like fade off and pretend like they didn't see it or get back to it in two, three, four, five days. If we text you, you have a 99.9% .9 open rate. You know, like I know you saw it. So. And I, I text the other people in the company or in the dealing with the client or dealing with the investment or whatever. I have other people in there more so just to have other people to, for uh, accountability. So if, if I text just you directly, that's a one-to-one -one text. But if I text your partner and he's in France and you're in UK, 
Well, it's different now because you guys are, you guys both know that the other person saw it besides me. And if I say, hey, tomorrow by 10, can you make sure that report's back? Well, it's way different if I say that to you or if I say that to the three of us. So yeah, that, I, I just wanted to bounce off something that you said quite interesting, you know, having long email threads, people slinking off, not, you know, being accountable and responsible. What I want to ask about is decision making, right? So how do you make sure that decisions happen fast at the right level? So you can't decide on everything, you know, you're just too busy for that. But making sure that they happen fast, but also that the right people who are qualified can give their input to those decisions, even if there is a final decider. Yeah, so decisions we do very quickly. So I only talk with the people that directly should be the ones answering or reviewing it. And we don't do a meeting about a meeting. Like when we say, hey, are we taking this client on? Or hey, are we going to invest in this? Or hey, are we going to do this event on this date? It's we decide and we go for it. Because otherwise, the year goes by real fast when you just like, hey, let's think about doing this for Q3. I don't like I don't I don't take clients on that want to do something at the end of the year. OK, call me at the end of the year. Like, you don't Makes sense. I, I'm, when I'm, I'm ready to go, like if we're going to do an event like I, I have an event coming this Sunday. I haven't even texted the speakers yet. I'm going to I know when I text them, I'm going to say this is the date. This is the time Sunday, 5 p.m. Here's a and I put them in a the group chat, we make a flyer, and then we go. I don't plan it out a month, and I don't need to, because I don't know what's going to happen a month from now. Mm. No. We, the, the, it's a whole new world now. Yeah. That, that's very interesting around the so power of now and living in the now and as immediately as possible. And I've found, yeah, I've got my, one of my friends is a CEO of Old Mutual uh, that's managing, I don't know, $5 trillion of assets, right? Every time I email him, he'll respond in like 10 minutes and somebody else will be like, oh, I can't, I'm not feeling right now. It's like, forget yeah. it. <laughs> so how many just, uh, yeah, uh, there's a trivia question. How many WhatsApp groups are you <laughs> managing? <laughs> I can't even count. I, I have no idea. I have whenever I post uh, text screenshots on social media for fun about something that's going on, people always go circle because I'll always have like last week I had 1,192 messages uh, that were unread. Well, think about how many I'm reading if it's 1,100 unread, and I have like a 99% open rate. So I you know I'm getting thousands of texts per day. Not counting WhatsApp, email, social, phone calls, Zoom calls, blah, blah, blah. I don't, it's mathematically not possible to, to handle anymore. So that's why I'm also so like blunt and efficient on everything. Because I just physically can't do the, if you send me like, hey, how are you, mate? I, I can't respond to that. Because I have 140 of those messages per day. That I, It's just mathematically, literally it's mathematically impossible. Think about just 140 of me saying, I'm great, how are you? It sounds so tiny, right? It's like, oh, that only takes 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Well, what's 140 times 30 seconds? That's freaking 70 minutes. Mm. Yeah, right? I've noticed that Weird. with, I have, a, I have a 13 year old son and he's grown up in the digital era. And even if he calls me on Viber or something like that, he, he won't ever say goodbye or anything like that. He just puts the phone down because <laughs> he knows we're like father son, like it doesn't need to say goodbye. And so it cuts out all the slack out uh, of, of the conversation, which is quite, you know, what you're effectively saying as well, which is what I've been advocating for 20 years. <laughs> if you talk to him two or three times a day, times 365, that's a thousand goodbyes that you didn't say yeah. a thousand mm -hmm. you're going to talk to him for the next decade or two before he gets too old and he's off running around right <laughs> college but in, until then for the next half a decade that's five thousand times that you save that moment five thousand times let's call it eight seconds forty thousand seconds was saved over something so small as like saying goodbye i know mm -hmm. it's weird when you start to actually think about it but i think i go down the rabbit hole on this stuff of like efficiencies I've had a lot of people that have passed away. So I think about life in a very yeah. real, like time sensitive mm -hmm. format of a lot of people, young people besides uh, family. Mm -hmm. And I just know that that 5,000 times eight seconds, 40,000 seconds, like it's a lot of seconds. Yes. Cause when at the end of your, at the end of your life, imagine if I said, Hey, would you like 40,000 more seconds? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, 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 <laughs> right. I've contemplated that about about that a lot as well. So uh, that that's why that's why we have this like rapid fire questioning with you because like let's milk every single second. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. So then it's the innovation bit. Like, how do you think about innovation in business? What what what's the role of innovation in businesses that you invest in? Sure. So anybody that tells me that they created something unique, I won't invest in. Because okay. they don't realize there's seven billion humans <laughs> who have seventy thousand thoughts per day. I don't want to do the math on seven billion times seventy thousand, but let's just say you didn't come up with it, right? Like there is no <laughs> there is no new thing. And so people are trying to reinvent the wheel, it's fine if they're just trying to make a better mouse trap. Like they're trying to make it better, that's fine. Somebody says that they made a new wheel, there's no new wheel. We have a wheel. We've had a wheel for tens of thousands of years. This is the wheel. And so I'm really focused on finding out what their thought process is. Why do they think people care? Because whenever I invest in a company where I launch a product, it's because there's an inefficiency in the market. I started an energy drink. I didn't plan on being the biggest energy drink, the best tasting one, because 900 drinks on the market and they all taste like cough syrup. They have that mm -hmm. same ingredient mm -hmm. that makes them taste like cough syrup. Okay, let me go to the laboratory, figure out if I can turn down this and add this. Can I make it better and add sucralose? Makes it taste better. And we won flavor of the year. Online poker site, there was 550 poker sites in the market. I went in because Bodog left and focused on sports. So there was no cool poker site. Great. Let me launch Victory Poker. I'm going to sign Dan Bilzerian, DJ Steve Aoki, Playboy Playmates, Young Poker Pros, put them all together and put them on TV all over the world. Cool. Cool. Not planning on being the biggest poker site. I want to be the cool kids poker site. And away we went. Hoverboards. Hoverboards were 1500 bucks to 1800 bucks. That's way too expensive. What if you had two kids? You're going to spend $3,600 for a freaking toy? No. I'll make it less than half the price. And they take eight weeks to ship. I'll ship it in one day. I'll ship mm. it for half the price in one day instead of you waiting for one or two months. Imagine telling your 13-year-old, oh, yeah, your hoverboard will be here in two months. Mm. <laughs> no way. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I look at inefficiencies in something and that's how I'm able to scale things really quickly is I'm trying to do things that I see what the market wants. There's already a market for poker sites. There's already a market for energy drinks. There's already a market for hoverboards. I'm not, I didn't reinvent anything. I just went off and scaled them so fast because I knew people cared at that price point. Imagine if I did it for half the price, faster, better, more efficient. Mm. And, and so what about then the product uh, design and development approach to that? How, how do you, you know, what's your approach to that? I look at what they've all done and I obsessively stock my competitors and I take what they're doing right, take, what they're, take out what they're doing wrong, improve on what they're doing right, add some features and I got a better. When, when Costco had a six foot teddy bear for $2.99, I made an eight foot teddy bear for $1.99. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't rocket science. Uh -huh. I just said, look, they're sold out of six foot teddy bears and they're too expensive. I'll make mine mm. bigger and fluffier and softer. I'll make different versions. So it's not just the same brown teddy bear. I'll make white. I'll make panda. Like, and I made it a little bit bigger and I made it cheaper. That was it. And so I'm looking at the, what you can find out everything about your competitors in a few minutes, but let alone a few hours, let alone a few days, or if you had a few weeks, imagine what you could learn. I can find out everything on Google, Yelp, social media, review sites. I can find out everything about an industry, let alone a specific competitor, their, how much their sales are, their funding, who left them, who works there now, who, like, who hates them, who loves them. I can read it all in a couple hours on Google. So I really try to research all those things and then say, okay, if I had a tanning salon, if I added these things here and these things here and took this away, this would make it better. If I change this and added this software, people will like it better because the software tells you when somebody needs tanning lotion instead of you trying to sell tanning lotion to the same person every day. It's like some little niche or a little feature could help improve the business before I've even opened it, before I've even made a website or a corporation or a business plan, I can find out how to make tanning salons more efficient you know, from Google. And so I'm really researching before I decide if I'm gonna invest in a company or start one. To what extent does your sort of gut feel play a role in that? And, and if so, like when did that gut feel start getting utilized? <laughs> yeah, like the gut feeling comes from experience. It's just you can feel a scenario of like, oh, you know, it's just like when you're playing poker. Like, you, like oh, I know this scene. Like, oh, I've, that guy just leaned forward and went, <sighs> you know, like 
I know what he's doing. <laughs> or this guy's like, oh, I don't know. I guess I'm all in. And you're like, oh, wait, I've seen that movie before. Like you start to have these feelings and these things of like, and so and with business, same thing. Like you can feel, or if you're in a relationship, you can feel those things, whether it's with your family, significant other, et cetera. You can feel those things because of experience and taking the good and bad from those previous things. And so I've lived a lot of lives. So I can feel right away, am I going to want to work with this person? Would I like him four, four years from now? Because when you invest in a company, you're getting married. Like you are with them. Mm. Like it's long term. Most of them take seven, eight years to ever exit if they ever make it that far. Mm. And so think about that. Like I cut you a check today. I'm most likely not going to make any money for eight years, if ever. We're married. So <laughs> like I, I know when I first meet somebody, if I want to be in that relationship. And so you can tell a lot just from your gut. Mm. So yeah, basically it's a marathon, not a sprint in that sense. Um, and, and then, so you mentioned money. So my next question is what is the key to making big money? And let's say big money is like seven plus figures in business. The key is to make something or invest in something or partner with something align with something that people care about. And what they care about is themselves, their time and their efficiency. And so, if you can help them lose weight, they care. If you can help them save time, they care. If you can help them look better, they care. If you can help them be smarter, they care, right? If you're just another thing, they don't care, right? And they won't care until everybody else makes them care. Meaning Oculus, those VR glasses are amazing. When have you heard anybody mention the word Oculus besides me for a while? Like, you know how long it's been since they came out nobody talks about it because it's not a thing that we care about yet will we care about vr one day yes did mm. this quarantine make it faster absolutely it fed, sped up the process a lot but that's still years away before we're actually going to be vr doing meetings in vr right mm -hmm. at some point we will and it's faster now but nobody cared yet nobody cared now if if you made glasses that help me see better well Think about how many we'd all buy because I need that. I, I, I look at stuff 24 hours a day or 18 hours a day. I look at stuff. And so that's a big difference of like an optional glass that I don't really care about. And maybe one day I'll care. Some people will buy that. Some, some people's disposable income will buy those glasses and they'll sit on their shelf. But if you sell glasses that I need for my daily site, well, that's why these companies are humongously multi-billion dollar companies because we all need it. It's not a luxury. So if I can just bounce off that, Dan, I love what you just said. I mean, for me working in tech and you seeing this as an investor, there's a lot of product heavy solution driven people out there who really care about the code, what they're building. And they kind of forget at the end of the day, they're here to serve someone, right? I mean, a design company, that's what product is. It's a medium to deliver value, solve a problem. So I love what you said. So in that respect, this is a bit more of a technical question and the specific one, but you know, you're going out to a market. How do you really kind of empathize with these people opposite you? You're entering a market and really, you know, get them to go from, okay, who the hell are you? To, okay, I'm happy to share with you my problems and what I'm facing. The best example is we're using Zoom right now. Mm -hmm. We should be using Skype or a lot of other platforms. We're using Zoom because it was so basic and simple. We make meetings and videos easy. That's it. Skype should have never let Zoom exist. Mm. Think about that. Skype's yeah. been around for how many years? Since I was forever. 20 years. It, it should have been like ruling the video and audio world forever, but it, it's never done that really. <laughs> right? And so it's fascinating because they could have done it. And there's a lot of other platforms like Zoom out there. And Zoom went from 10 million users to over 200 million users this year. The sheer scale of that is sickening to think about why because it's just so simple hey you can email out this link and we can all watch from four of us up to ten thousand of us depending on your level great with skype i think of it as a one-to-one -one communication platform and that's why i never talk about it with so many other platforms that are out there pre-zoom or during zoom at the same time as zoom nobody talks about it. we all talk about one platform and so Making something very simple and direct is a huge advantage. Everybody else is talking about, I've got 64 features. Who cares? 
I'm using Zoom for this, for the three of us to talk. That's what I'm using it for. All those other cherry on top, and I, I don't want to release my, if, imagine if Zoom said, I'm not going to release it until I can do this, this, and this. Okay, well, nobody would have cared. It would have been another platform that just existed. They were, Makes. They, and so when people are very heavy in the technology space, I call them artists that won't sell their painting. Mm. They just want to keep adding. They want to keep mm. adding. I can yeah. do one more feature, one more feature. Listen, yeah. when Instagram came out, it was photos. And then they made 15 second videos and then 60 second videos and then Instagram stories and then IGTV. Back then, it was literally just a photo platform. There was 200 plus competitors. Nobody cared. They all went Instagram mm. because it was just a really good looking photo platform. They just scrolled through. That was it. Mm. Everything else can be added. Uh, so, so uh, what, is, what is then uh, the biggest challenge you've overcome in your business life so far? It's just people. It's getting them to do stuff or care as much as I do or execute at the speed, that, at the speed of Dan. Like, I'm, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's fix it. Let's go. I don't, you know, it's just so much of this lallygagging all the time. I, that's always the biggest struggle is that if I say this and they say yes, okay, let's do it. Instead of, there's so many times. It's just, so my biggest frustration or my biggest hurdle is always people wanting to do something. When I say wanting, they think they want to do something, but they don't actually want to do it. Like mm. a lot of people want to go work out every day. They mm. don't actually want to go work out every day. They think mm. they do. They would like to in the back of their head. Then the actual execution of going out there five days a week and doing it, that's a small percentage of people. Mm. And so there's a, there's a constant struggle within the companies of always finding, and I'm, that's why I'm so picky about whether it's the founder or staff member or whatever, it's finding those couple percent, the people that are willing to reply at 10, 22 PM because they willingly wanted to not like, oh, I can't believe Dan's messaging me at 10 o'clock. Yeah. That person yeah. doesn't work for me. They can't. Mm -hmm. So what, what role does UX design, user experience design play in your mind in, in these kind of digital platforms? That's very important because people just need ease. Like Snapchat, is the sexiest platform of all time and it's horrible, like actually atrocious. And I've done 90,000 paid posts. I've never paid people for Snapchat because no brand cares, no influencers care. Like, because the platform is, you can't search screen names. You have to type it in exactly to the letter and you can't find things in order. It shows you things you didn't look for. It just does everything wrong imaginable and so instagram stories came and ate their lunch that was it mm. Mm. like that's it they just didn't do what they used to do when it was just a platform with cool filters it was awesome then they added on so many silly things and it's just now it's useless yeah i did a whole talk about this and i predicted how that's gonna, gonna not gonna work for them and, and there you go you're saying that so what are what are then the core best practices for growth in your view you know give us like two or three things around growth for companies what is a must-have for growth yeah the must-have is social media it doesn't matter what you are i don't care if you're selling goldfish or you're building tech platforms or you sell insurance that really does not matter. I don't care if you do bowling. It literally doesn't matter what you're doing. You have to have social media. And it's not that you have to be funny or quirky or smart. It's that you have to have it. And you've got to create content about your business. Otherwise, nobody thinks about you. Nobody talks about you. Nobody shares you because you're just another thing. And you're not going to have top of mind awareness. Nobody's going to think about you. If you might come up once, people think they do one press release and that's, oh, I did my press release. <laughs> Okay, that was on Monday. What about on Thursday? Nobody <laughs> thinks about you on Thursday. You know why they don't think about you on Thursday? Because there's been 70 other press releases. So they don't, you're not a thought for them anymore. And think about a month from now. And so with social media, it's critical to be on all the main platforms and just putting out content about the company, about the office, about what the mission is, what does it do, what is the product. Not selling, not selling, just talking about it, just showing the behind the scenes is a big deal. Uh, press is useful or having that consistent flow of it. So it's not just, hey, we put out a press release. It's getting on 
online blogs. It's getting on with, uh, what's it called? Somebody getting on podcasts, the brand getting out there. It's getting on the different media sites. It's getting like being involved in the mix and just being out there. Otherwise, again, everybody has a ton of competitors. You got to stand out. And the third thing is having a, a quarterback, having somebody that's the front person because that front person can help build the brand. Like if I said to you, who's the CEO of Southwest Airlines? Who's the CEO of American Airlines? Just stop me if you, if you know any CEO. Who's the CEO of United Airlines? But mm -hmm. if I said, who's the CEO of Virgin Airlines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's what's fascinating is that person with Richard Branson went out there and built that. Hey, who's the CEO of Ford? Who's the CEO of Toyota? Who's the th right? But if I say CEO of Tesla, boom, you know the name. So, and so, so a front facing person is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, there, there is an element there that the, the, the ones that we know were the founder CEOs. So they, they set out the original purpose of those companies and they kind of like put their heart, soul, and mind into it. Uh, whereas the other ones are effectively employees with high salaries. Uh, and so how, how do you work on your personal growth and especially on the like mindset and stuff like that? I'm just constantly watching and reading and listening. I live inside of the internet. So I'm, I'm following all the people that are, I look up to or are doing things that I like. And even if I don't agree with all of it, I still want to watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm constantly watching. I just want to see it. I want to mm -hmm. see what they're doing. What are they thinking? Who are they working with? What podcast are they going on? What books are they posting about? What events are they going to? Like, I just want to see what they're up to, whether I'm going to do it or not. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is Gary Vee doing? What is Ed Milet doing? These are my friends too. Mm -hmm. I, I talk with them daily, but I'm still watching them as a fan, right? Mm -hmm. Even when the people that I'm working with or are my client or I'm watching, I just watching the scene of what is this guy doing? What is she doing? Why they're doing that? Where they're going? Like, I just want to know. Uh, that's like I, my online digital stalking. When I say that, I don't mean in like a creepy, like, oh, I'm stalking. Yeah, I'm yeah. stalking from a business sense. I want to know. Analyzing. Yeah. yeah, analyzing. And so where, last question, where do you see yourself in 38 years time? Wow. Uh, I'll be 76 years old. I will be, I mean, I'll be doing not this. I won't be running anything at that point. I'll just have my fund and my charity. I'll just be investing in companies and charity. That's it. I don't, my ultimate goal is to save the world but on the basic level of food and water and shelter. It's not about, mm -hmm. I'm not going to cure any diseases. There's plenty of people trying to do those things. Mm -hmm. I think I can cure the basics. And I think at 76, if I had a few billion dollars, I could cure the basics. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, I don't need the money for me. Like, mm -hmm. like I don't post about stuff. I don't buy stuff. I have the same, you know, like I haven't had a car in five years. Like I don't care about this stuff. I know I can fix certain parts of our world in the most basic level. That's fantastic, man. I just have to like breathe into that for a couple of times. That's, that's cool. Uh, like Dan, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you and like truly honor to speak to you and you know, thank you so much. <laughs> All the best. Okay. Right, guys, thank you. Take care. Take care. Good one.